Secondly, in, in many cases, they have written laws now where they are openly usurping the rules of the divine creator. Now, I know I've had many stouters with folks over time in relation to the validity of the King James Bible or sections of it. And I know that as a result, many people have been quite suspicious of me. But I'm going to say and refer back that if one is to refer to the King James Bible and one is to look at some of the essence that is referred there, it makes it clear as the foundation law of their system that the divine creator did grant us all free will and that the divine creator is the ultimate grantor of all existence, all law, all life. This is built into their system. So we remind them in the opening line and make clear. Now the opening. I, and I'm going to insert my name just for the example, I, Frank Anthony O'Collins, originally born at the geographical place also known as Melbourne, now living at the geographical place also known as Sydney, and being of age and sound mind, you make ordain and declare this instrument to be the public record of the expression of my will, revoking all prior wills and codicils. Let me explain that paragraph. When we consider the uh, claims of the Roman cult, it may surprise us to consider that the Roman cult, in designing its laws, is, is well aware that it cannot claim the land itself. It can't. So what it does is it surveys the land, and it calls the land, in the description of the land, geography. And then what it does when it creates a survey it calls that survey in its most raw form a topography. Now the words sound different, but they're quite distinct. Geography being the technical term for land, earth, soil, height, latitude, longitude, and topography being the use of, of names and other descriptions which may or may not be political, proprietary, uh, and claimed as, uh, as prior knowledge or intellectual property. So the political apparatus, when we describe, for example, I can describe North America as a description of geography. But when I describe the United States as a political survey, that is a topography. So if I want to make clear, and you've heard people say on the land, in the land, above the land, uh, all these different phrases, if I want to make it really, really clear so no one can split hairs, I simply say originally born at the geographical place. Not the topographical place, the geographical place. And that's why I don't say county, I say city, because the name of the city is used also as a geographical place. The other thing you'll notice in this opening uh, paragraph, or second paragraph, is we make the statement to be the public record of the expression of my will. The reason we say that is that the ancient tradition, which is not usurped, but it is cunningly hidden in the Wills Act and subsequent acts, the ancient tradition is the expression of will is always auricular that is it is always spoken and that the writing of a will is always a record is always a memorial now they trick us and the reason they trick us is to ensure that we render our wills deficient effectively they wrote a system to ensure that most wills all wills ultimately are rendered null and void because they contradict maxims of law. You might have heard the maxim, one cannot be a witness to one's own cause. Well, if one cannot be a witness to one own, one's own cause, then one cannot be a, te a tester, uh, a, uh, one who testifies uh, for or against one's own cause. One can state one's cause, but one cannot state it and be witness. That's the same as trying to be the judge 
jury and executioner. So you see the subtlety. We make that clear from the beginning that we know the subtlety. Now then, to comply to the form, remember we don't want to miss complying to the form. We make it clear in the first uh, expression of the recitals. We say first, let it be known to all whom these presents come. So we're making clear our knowledge that it's a deed. With the divine creator as my witness, and with those who acknowledge this instrument by their testaments, I hereby affirm that this instrument is to be known as my one, only, and true last will and testament, expressing accurately my intention and purpose, written clearly at my direction, and signed and sealed freely by my own hand. Now, I don't want to be bogged down because we'll, we'll be here all night, but I want to cover some of these things because they are absolutely embedded with important technical information. What that first statement says is that this is clearly a deed. In terms of those witnessing this act, the divine creator, it, we call as our first witness. And the word acknowledgement is important because acknowledgement means the perfection of a notice. One could use the word recognize, but here we use the word acknowledge because it, it, it refers to the fact that this instrument is perfected. And we acknowledge the testaments are in reflection to those that are witnessed, and then we refer to the form of the instrument being the last will and testament. Let's keep going. Second, to ensure the proper and lawful administration of my estate, the satisfaction uh, of all debts and obligations and dispose of all gifts, grants and bequests, I hereby appoint a general executor and guardian hereafter named a sovereign over my entire known and unknown estate and the rules of succession for the appointment of lesser executors and their administrators as fiduciary. Well, this is important because this is stating very clearly that in order for the estate to be properly administered, you're appointing, lawfully appointing, a general executor and guardian, which is your right. It is your right to appoint a general executor, even though the role is hidden from you. And we make clear that the general executor is the sovereign over not only the estate, but all the unknown estate as well. And we'll get to that in the third point. I hope for those who are listening, this is making sense as we keep following through. So the third part is, as all property, rights and devices created by the existence of my estate in the name of the estate or administered on behalf of the estate must first be properly identified and brought under the administration of the general executor and guardian before any directions of disposal to beneficiaries can make in that commence. I hereby direct and empower the General Executive and Guardian to use all necessary authority and powers to conduct a thorough tracing and accounting of all assets, property, rights, benefices, benefits, trust, securities, and negotiable instruments for the entire estate. Again, I, I apologize for the wording, but it has to be very, very clear. What are we saying here? There are some brilliant researchers, and I have paid homage to them regularly on calls. And there are some brilliant people today who are making very clear remedy to you, for you, for others, all around the world. And I commend each and every one of them who is uh, showing knowledge in these areas, showing people how to use that knowledge, uh, and doing it in a way where they're not seeking any kind of financial benefit for themselves. One of the mistakes we've made when we've uncovered this, and I've been guilty of it as well, is to make presumptions. Now, the presumptions we make, in fact, are those things that the public servants or the individual contractors acting as agents have not formally acknowledged to us, have not formally agreed are the, are the, are the truth. We don't know how many trusts have been established in our name in their system. It could be one, it could be three, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands. You and I don't know that for certain. So if we put a number down, we are making a presumption. We don't know how much money 
has been going through those trusts on our behalf or behalf of the estate. Again, that would be making a presumption. So what we're saying here is, look, we're not making presumptions. We're merely saying, or I am saying to my general executor, as is my right, before anything is done concerning the disposal of the estate, we need a tracing. We need a thorough accounting. And you are empowered to go out there and find it all. That is a job that the general executor and guardian needs to do to properly administer their estate. Okay, fourth. This is the fourth point. Upon the proper completion of tracing and accounting of the entire estate, it is my first intention to ensure the continued care and well-being being of my wife, our kin and heirs and successors. Should any residual remain after fulfilling of my first intention, it is my second intention that a gift of one half of the residue be placed in trust for the benefit of the state and community of my original birth. It is my third and final intention that the other half of residue of residual assets, sorry, be placed in trust for the benefit of the present Ukrainian community of which I am a member. Let me explain this. The classic will you see, and it is a feature of all wills, that you nominate those beneficiaries of the property of the estate. If you don't nominate them, then you are failing. You don't have to, by the way. You actually don't have to in the law. The law doesn't require you to nominate the beneficiaries. It actually says in statute you cannot deny your spouse, but it doesn't require you to give specific amounts or to name every one or every piece of property. But it is considered for tradition, and here is, is the point. This is part of the intention and purpose of the will. What is the intention and purpose of the deed? Here, the intention and purpose of the will is for the benefit of these particular groups. Now, you'll notice that no proportion of the estate is identified when we describe our kin, our family. Because if you're not married, then you would nominate a wife. Or if you have been married second, then you'd nominate. Or if you have grandchildren, you'd include them. This is, of course, entirely up to you to refine to your specific needs. But it's an example. But there is no specific number given when we describe the uh, family because we don't know the full estate yet. That's what we're saying in the third point. In the third point, the general executor and guardian needs to go and do a tracing first before we can establish exactly what we have or what we don't have. Now, the other thing you'll see is we make a point of saying that we intend on residual, and residual just simply means the remaining assets after there's been a liquidation or disposal, the first part of our fulfillment has been done, the remainder or the residual is what's left. You see that we make a point here of saying 50% to the original community or state of our birth, which would be a Roman state, and then I had put the option there of, of Eucadia. That's entirely up to you. you. You can choose to do nothing. There is no rule in Eucadia that requires you need to bequest any of your estate to Eucadia. There is no rule at all. It's your choice. But the point that is made here is this. If it is true that the entire estate that is created in your name is substantial, that is many times over what you have presently identified as your estate, and that it is of such a substance that you could live extremely comfortably with even a fraction of it, it would be proof that one is not ready, capable, or mature of being a general executor if one then claimed all of it to the detriment of those societies. If you think the Roman system is going to allow you to go in there and claim the entire estate and say, see you later, good luck, and watch it fall, then you've got rocks in your head. That kind of stupid thinking is what will cause the system to fight to the death. But if you go to the system and show, look, I am truly competent as being a general executor 
as demonstrated by this instrument, 